you want to do some sort of like cool MTV films introduction? Oh, yeah. I mean, probably I imagine like the M has like headphones on, you know, and there's like, uh, I don't know, like a Liechtenstein like dots on it or I mean, I guess that's not really audio in a way. Do you just want me to do like rock and guitars? Like, yeah, Yeah. kids love Liechtenstein and rock and guitars. (laughs) saying something about movies or nostalgia or i was saying welcome to your inner child is an idiot this is the <laughs> podcast where we look back on things from our childhood or early adulthood in this case and see if they were any good my name is dj possibly your childhood and our adulthood yeah. i'm damon by the way i'm sorry i stepped on you now now uh, you've got me thinking voice. that like there are children listening and, and that's getting real weird Dude, hey kid don't don't you no. first off i know you're not listening you don't want to hear me i sound like one of your teachers yeah. You need a cool podcast to listen to where they tell you not to do drugs. Listen, I'm like, I play music for a, a living and I barely listen to music for fun. I almost don't listen exclusively to podcasts. But when I was a kid, maybe kids today are more open minded than I was. But like when I was a kid, the talk radio was like the worst possible torturous punishment that we could possibly be visited upon. Like if my sister and I couldn't agree on a radio station, it was like, my dad would be like putting it on am you know 701 or whatever it was <laughs> when you said talk radio i assumed we were talking about npr but it sounds like you're talking about like well i'm just gonna put it on am 701 the most you know pedagogical bible radio that we have in the central ohio area he also had motivational tapes so those were the real Ooh. he didn't want those because he would he'd be he'd like you know have his finger on it like i'm gonna push this in if you don't i swear i swear to god i swear to god i'll push this motivational tape in we're here to talk about napoleon dynamite 2004 i want to say Ooh, yeah it's gotta be in my college years because i did see it in college napoleon dynamite 2004 you're safe i was right well done well done i am so good at that guessing years I just want to say real quick, before we leave the topic of talk radio, me and my brother loved talk radio. It oh, might surprise that, you. That checks out. Love listening to NPR. Had little inside jokes about some of the, you probably call them DJs, but they were just mostly reporters. Right. Like every time Robert Siegel on All Things Considered would come on, I would go, ah, because we like to imagine that he was a literal <laughs> seagull. <laughs> And, that's a pretty uh, you good know, bit. Of course, we love that Terry Gross didn't necessarily laugh at things. You just like to say, that's funny. Great. That shows a lot of... Talk radio. Love it. NPR. Doing great work. Hope you stay funded. (laughs) So was this... This wasn't the first MTV film, right? Because this was like... I remember there's being a big deal and I didn't understand why at first. Was it the first MTV film? Was there a Road Rules Real World Challenge with Meryl Streep in the role of Puck? I'm thinking also, I'm conflating it with Nickelodeon movies. Yeah. They also started making movies for a minute. I should really stay in my lane, because when I start talking about like production companies yeah. and stuff, I just have no Back idea. Back off, buddy. Because MTV Films, they, oh, okay, they were, they did Beavis and Butthead do America. Okay. Oh, yeah. But Joe's Apartment was the first MTV film. You probably remember that with Jerry O'Connell and a, oh, a slew of that. singing cockroaches. I actually do remember that. Wild. I remember wanting to see it, and then I- like all kids, read the reviews in the local paper, and I was like, oh, that doesn't sound very good. I'm not going to watch that. Thank you, AP film critic. What was your take on Napoleon Dynamite? Was that a thing for you and your friends? Did you watch it? What? TJ, thank you for asking. I went to school in rural Indiana, so anywhere we had to go was like a Lord of the Rings style quest <laughs> to get there. And I remember me and my friend Bethany were out in some very small Indiana town that would have felt very big to us because our college town was yet even smaller than Kokomo. all the other surrounding. Mm-hmm. Oh no, Kokomo, that would have been a sweet ass gig. Crawfordsville, that was, oh, we're going to the big city, kids. We're going to Crawfordsville. Maybe even, ooh, we could go to Bloomington. Oh, that's the real deal. That's like, I'm gonna make it after <laughs> all. But I feel like we were in like a somewhat another town and we just took we didn't want to go back to greencastle indiana and so i think we took a chance on going to see napoleon dynamite i think we had seen good things right 
like the commercials seemed kind of fun. So we took a chance. It was me and her and a mother and son sort of catty corner to us in this fairly small theater. And we're like, well, this movie's going to bomb. Let's let's just enjoy it. And it was right up our alley in, in terms of our sense of humor. Bethany has a very contagious thing, which is she rarely will be charmed by an actually cleverly phrased joke. Mm-hmm. But if you can say that joke in a very off kilter like <laughs> manner of speaking, she will hone in on why did you say it that way? And she will laugh. And so I became like very good at sensing what Bethany would find funny. And this movie is like chock full of people saying things in very yeah. specific ways. So we were having a great time. And I remember we left and we felt like prophets returning back to college. And we're like, no, we Spread just saw this news. wonderful movie <laughs> called Napoleon Dynamite. And then kind of similar to what we talked about with Austin Powers, mm, yeah, like the, the, the bloom fell off the rose because yeah. it became a quotathon, and everyone was talking about it. Everyone had a vote for Pedro shirt. And it was just, it almost felt like, was I under some sort of spell from a witch? But- I mean, I think I've seen it since, and it is still really good, but it's hard to like separate it by how how everyone yeah. was just sort of quoting it at you in a very forcible way. Yeah, I think Austin Powers is a very apt comparison because it's on its own, like on its face, you go to see it, it exists on its own and is a funny film. It's good. Yes. And then As we've I think, although I think this is one that if you don't like the shtick, like you're not going to have a good time. So yeah, Lauren didn't that ever really, it didn't resonate with her. And I remember being like, oh, really? But I could also like watching it somewhat recently. I haven't seen it in years, but I get it. It's kind of like a Wes Anderson thing. If that's not right. your thing, you're not going to have a good time. You're not going to all of a sudden be like, I get it now. You're going to understand what it is, not like it, and then just kind of grin and bear it until the credits roll. But this, <laughs> right. And then it just gets chewed up by the quote machine of, in our case, college students just really enjoying it, which I, again, this one, not so much as Austin Powers, but the, you're liking it wrong, you know, like being sort of uptight about which quotes, which, you know, like yelling at the llama, I didn't think was funny, but I'm trying to remember which things I did find funny. I'll have to. Me and Bethany especially liked, I guess you could say things are getting pretty serious. Yeah. When Kip says, I guess you could say things are getting pretty serious. (laughs) And Uncle Rico is also currently in a new, you know, phase of his career playing yeah. on White, White Lotus, Lotus. Yeah. Which is a real treat. I appreciate that. I, pr- I appreciate I that appreciate too. That. Thank f- you, Uncle Rico. You, Uncle Rico, who has a also, name, I AKA presume. John Grease. Ah, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just filed away. We'll die with that information, DJ, that his name is John Grease and he played Uncle Rico in the 2004 comedy Napoleon Dynamite. Also played a homeless man on an episode of Seinfeld that won't give Kramer back his Tupperware. Huh. John Grease things to look forward to. This is not good podcasting, but did you just say Tupperware? <laughs> Do you think I that's how it's pronounced? Won't respond to the question. <laughs> I wish this is one of the like the first time I ever said Tupperware, sorry. The first time I ever said chassis out loud and I said chassis is one of those where I'm like I never said that word. Like when I I asked a woman, I was verifying her address and I said, "And are you still in Tucson, Arizona?" Ooh, no. <laughs> never saw it in print. Yeah. Never saw it in print. Just something I hear. Now my brother lives in Tucson. Oh. So you can imagine the egg on my face. Yeah. Well, that's why you had to move there to make up for it. <laughs> to make get it back in their good graces. <laughs> I don't really have anything else to say. I think this will be a fine. I don't think that I will laugh uproariously. I think that I will enjoy it. I don't think I'm going to get new things. I might enjoy some things less than I did 20, almost 20 years ago. Uh, again. <laughs> Why did you open just shy, a carton? Just shy of 20 years. Why did you open a carton of rotten eggs when I said that? That was really rude. <laughs> signpost towards death. Mm. This whole podcast is pretty much <laughs> signpost towards death. I don't know why we started it. We're going to watch Napoleon Dynamite. Watch along with us. We'll be back in a little bit. Just to be clear, we're watching the movie and not the animated cartoon show that lasted one <gasps> season. I forgot about that. <laughs> I never saw it. No. No. There's no reason. Okay. Yeah, we're going to watch the movie. Come watch with us. Come on. Come on. Come on over. (laughs) 
pretend you're Uncle Rico coming to my home door to door to sell me on patreon.com slash your inner child is an idiot. I'm just a 2004 Utah housewife. Dressed, Idaho. <laughs> Idaho dressed as an 80s Idaho housewife. <laughs> mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and I come in lasciviousness. Okay, I'm creeped out. Please go away. Yes. I've closed the door. Now, with our 24-piece set, I've got a little something you're going to like. Okay. It's a uniform resource locator. Okay. To your inner child is an idiot dot commercial. There's a lot of big words. I'm in. <laughs> That's how you can... Well, I have a laminated name tag here, so that Excellent. shows you that I know all the answers. Official. And I want you to go there to that website homepage landing page for the homepage website. Starting to get curious about your accent, but trying not to bring it up. <laughs> and I want you to go there and donate to your inner child as an idiot, you know, and you can donate at different tiers and, you okay. know... You can get special gifts. We don't have any clipper ship models that you can have, but, you know, you might get your name read in the show notes. I want you that. Might, <laughs> you, might, you might get a personalized song by DJ. Is that something we offer? Mm, sure. Hmm. <laughs> Different tier. Just came up with it on the spot. Anyway, I like that we picked the most memorable aspect of this movie and really just went all the way with it. The part about the door-to-door salesmanship. That's, <laughs> that's the part that everyone always quotes from Napoleon Dynamite. That's the... Uh, Am the I keeping I, the interest on this ad going? <laughs> People still listening? Oh, we finished a long time ago. <laughs> I actually recorded the podcast with someone else <laughs> while you were talking. I'm just going to see if I can sprinkle in bits of Damon later. <laughs> just get some laughs in. Anyway, you're in a child is an idiot.com. Go check it out. You know what a Patreon is. And we are back. We watched Napoleon Dynamite. 2004. 2004's. Is that the year it came out? I think you're right. Jared Hess, director. Yeah. If you're mm-hmm. doing the AP style. John Hader. I don't know how to say his name. Hader? Hader? I think so, yeah. Related to Bill Hader because they both spell and pronounce their names differently. <laughs> yeah. You know, I like a movie that starts with a white stripes needle drop. Oh, yeah. But I, I, th- this watching it, watching it the second time, I noticed it's awkwardly paused, which is fitting with the rest of the movie is that yeah. it doesn't start when you think it should, which is at the beginning of the credits. It's like 13 seconds in. Finally, yeah. the song starts. At least one credit has already gone by. I appreciate that. I, I do wanna, like that white stripes song, though. I don't want to begin with a tangent, but white stripes and. That's a band that I like like conceptually more than I actually like their music. Well, you like, like you like branding. You like branding when it comes to a band. I like a good branding. Like, I like a good. Are they sisters or married couple mystery? <laughs> you Will like they, a, a band they with commit specific, into incest? <laughs> you like a band with specific hexadecimal colors. Yes, you know, and yeah. you got to commit to those on yeah. every album. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do a recap? Do it's gonna, I? It's going to be a tough, tough recap. It's because, either going to be the longest recap or the shortest recap. I'm going to go for... Let's go for the latter, shall we? <laughs> I'm going to go for shortest. This is a movie about Napoleon Dynamite and his brother Kip Dynamite, presumably, and Rico, possibly also Dynamite, his uncle. And, you know, after an accident with his grandmother, who is his guardian, Uncle Rico comes to stay. Napoleon's just going through the usual high school issues, meeting girls, asking girls to prom, drawing terrifying drawings of girls. Putting tots in your pocket. Putting tots in your pocket, feeding a llama ham, which I'm not a biologist, but that doesn't seem accurate. They'll get a taste for it. You gotta watch the pigs. And, you know, Kip and Rico start a door-to-door salesman business. (sighs) What else happens? That's good enough. Eventually, it all works out. Pedro, you've got Pedro. Oh, yeah. Pedro runs for class president and he wins in a startling upset. He wins because Napoleon is able uses to his dance new dancing skills to Jamiroquai. Yeah, this is an interesting. I guess I never really thought about it, but there's the barest thread of a plot. I would there's, even say that's generous. <laughs> there is the barest that are, I wouldn't even say it's a character study either. It's just sort of, a, you know. It's a slice I, of life first, kind of thing because there, so, there's yeah. not there's not vignettes because there are, you know, they're through line characters. It's not like they skip right. around it's that not a way. Series of skits. In fact, yeah. I misremembered that this was a series of skits, but it wasn't. It was based on a short film that they did. Yeah, and apparently it's it's based on 
the director, Jared, has his life. And it like the, a lot of the anecdotes. So at one point, for example, a farmer shoots a cow in front of a school bus of children, which <laughs> I was like, why the fuck does this happen? I forgot about that. And it's because this happened in real life. And he just thought, this is a weird thing that happened in my real life. Let's put it in this movie. And that actually, I find not that particular thing. I don't find that charming, but I find that aspect of it charming. Like, cause it's the idea just of like, grabbing just these various, yeah, he's just like partial anecdotes from your life. Yeah. It's kind of like, I hate to say it a little like a Christmas story in that way when they're just like, I remember this thing that happened, but in this case, it's a little bit more connected because they do have like, like a Is beginning. Is the word you're looking for a pastiche? I refuse. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into the story, though, we got to acknowledge the... <laughs> Didn't we already get into the story? <laughs> we got to acknowledge the best part of the movie, which is the opening credits. <laughs> They're good opening credits. I like, I don't know what you would call this, diegetic credits. <laughs> each credit is like, at first it starts with meal plates, and yeah. each meal represents a character. But there's something that one of the characters eats at some point in the movie. Right. John Grease, who plays Uncle Rico, gets a pallid looking steak yeah kip gets an overly cheesed nacho plate tina majorino gets a peanut butter sandwich in a bag it's great i mean it's very charming there's chapstick for the producer and yeah. various drawing pencils for the writers I like it's- the the hand like adjusts the pencils they're not quite right and then so apparently that was added later like towards the end of production and it was there seems to be this is all like hearsay from mostly from imdb and wikipedia credit so grain of salt but they're like the guy who played kip apparently it was like his idea but then like someone executed it and it was john Hader's hands but then the studio didn't like his hands so there's some of it is his hands and some of it's like a hand model (laughs) which is just a ridiculous anecdote if that's true i do i think my favorite type of credits go animated cartoon credits yeah it and then this, so whatever you'd call this, some sort of weird collage credits where, you know, it, there's a physical credit in some way, like that's been built or yeah. made out of condiments in this case. And then just standard text credits. Lowest form of credits is when the name of the movie is matching the branding on the poster. I always find that a little jarring. Like, I like it when... You know, even though it's a big blockbuster movie, it just says Jurassic Park. It doesn't have the actual logo logo. of Jurassic Park with the Tyrannosaurus Rex. You know? I prefer... Anything um, else? I think the lowest form of credit is, this is not fair to older movies because it's the style of the time. They just have like curtains, like it's a theater show, and they just have credits for like (laughs) 90 minutes before the movie starts with like very sweeping... Did we somehow lap the movie? Are we already done? (laughs) How do you feel about his horse drawing? Oh, man. I do have a note that these horses drawings are, difficult. are, first off, horses are difficult. And to make them flying, I feel like is a cheat because the trick to horses is getting all those feet on a plane of existence and they all look it? like they belong yeah. in the place they're supposed to yeah. be connecting to on the body. I do want to say the drawings in this are, they are perfect high school drawings yeah. i mean they are triggering for me <laughs> in that you know when i would be not i was a good cartoonist or course, illustrator not, not gonna lie i'm not gonna give you some false modesty you've no seen my bruce it. kaladin right <laughs> oh yeah that is true your bruce kaladin Sorry, that was a real, is very much in that. style <laughs> that was, we can cut that. That was a, a very inside baseball reference <laughs> like literally the two of us are the only people well i mean I, I feel like we can do you want to tell the audience who Bruce Kaladin is and his alter ego? I think we've discussed this on the podcast before. I had a superhero that I drew in junior high, primarily, mm-hmm. and his name was Kaladin. I don't know where I got that name or what it means or anything. It was like, but his <laughs> Is it like Kaladin? I don't know. His and you secret, just put a C in front of it? <laughs> maybe. I wouldn't have known what a Paladin was either. But his, his the character's secret identity was Bruce Kaladin. <laughs> It's like if his name was Bruce Batman instead of Bruce Wayne. <laughs> Bruce Kaladin. But it was more- My in, name's you know, Spy. In my, James Spy. <laughs> in my defense, I think I meant it as like a James Bond, you know? Right. A code name, possibly. Code name. There are at least seven Bruce Kaladins in this world. I can't defend 13-year-old teacher. He didn't know what he was doing. He's a fool. 
So yeah, these drawings are great. When he shows Trisha her drawing where it took him three hours to finish the shading on her upper lip, <laughs> like those are drawings I've seen in my life. And that's a very specific style, like yeah. a junior high schooler. Little concern that it's a high school student, but I mean, it's on the nose in terms of someone who is very passionate about their drawing and thinks they're a really good artist. Yeah. He, I mean, Napoleon might be a little stunted overall. I think we, I don't know. He's, uh, so let's I, talk about Napoleon. Yeah. The minute this started, my first thought is like, oh, wait, oh, God, are we just going to be making fun of neurodivergent people this whole movie? Yeah. I had that same feeling because 2004 me thought was like, oh, isn't this funny? This is a weird character. Immediately feels like bullying from a viewer standpoint. From cool people like Jared Hess. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do think... I don't want to let the movie off the hook, but it, as the movie goes on, we're not totally shitting on Napoleon the whole time, but we're we're also not 100% celebrating him. Like, we still are kind of making fun of him. <laughs> so, I don't know where I land. It doesn't make me feel 100% comfortable. I'll tell you that much. How about you? I think when it started, I was uncomfortable. But then as the movie goes on, you start to realize, I agree with you 100%, by the way, that... I don't think the movie is off the hook entirely, but I yeah. do think it is asking us to somewhat sympathize with Napoleon, even while sort of laughing at how he reacts to the world. That being said, like everyone else in this movie is also really fucking awkward. Like yes. everyone we encounter, yeah. Deb is awkward, Pedro's awkward, the school staff is awkward, Kip is awkward. Yeah. And the only characters who are confident and like maybe don't have that sort of neurodivergent vibe that Napoleon and the others give off are, I mean, I don't think this movie has villains per se, but they are the people the movie is not asking us to sympathize with. Like the people yeah. like Summer or Trisha or Uncle Rico yeah. are all sort of not the best people and you just certainly don't want to relate to them. And so there is a part of me that is like, the movie is asking us to sympathize with these people over these more... I don't know what you would call the opposite. Uh, at of least appearing but neurotypical. Yeah. yeah. Although Uncle yeah, Rico clearly is nursing some sort of trauma that he's going through because he is. <laughs> I know he's like yeah. upset because his girlfriend left him and that's who comes back at the end of the movie. And then. I presumed that. Yes. And then he's like really kind of stuck in 82. 82. Like really, <laughs> in a way that's like. He's not reminiscing. It's like worse than an Al Bundy. You know how stuck in the moment he oh, is. Oh, I forgot about. Yeah. Well, describe Uncle Rico for people who aren't. So he lives in a van and yes. he is constantly. No river visible. Revisiting his, I guess, was it high school? Like right before, like he wasn't actually a starting quarterback in high school, but it sounds like he wished he would have been and he was on the bench. And if they had only put him in, they would have won state. And he's like, insists on reliving 82 by filming himself throwing footballs towards the camera Really yeah. awkwardly. <laughs> like, you can't see where the football goes. So I feel like, am I getting all the information I could be getting from this video, Rico? Yeah, and you can't really see even in our view of it where the football's land, but it looks really awkward. So I think <laughs> we're, it, you know, and that's funnier. So it could be just that. But it's like, I think we're meant to think like, you know, he said on that, he actually isn't good, but he likes football. And he also, I don't know, he comes to take care of the kids, but actually it's really just Napoleon because... <laughs> Kip, Kip is 32. 32. I don't know if Napoleon was exaggerating, what? but I mean, that is yeah. presumably his age. I do want to say thank you for pointing it out because I don't think mm -hmm. I ever caught it in the multiple times I watched it in the 2000s, but I always just put him in the trope of like the football star. Yeah. But he isn't he the star. Yeah. He was on the bench. <laughs> he just imagines that if he had if ever he had been given in, a chance, they would have won. State. He could have taken them to state. It is a very funny detail that at least I could miss, but yeah. he wasn't a football star. He was just some guy on the team. I just had that same thought recently with Joe Burrow. Like if they had just put me in, the Bengals, you know, would have won. But No, yeah. I totally agree with everything you're saying to the point that I don't even have to add anything because what you're saying is 100% what I believe. Less than a year ago, I educated you on all this. We did a whole episode <laughs> on the Super Bowl. <laughs> you're absolutely right. And my apologies. Wait, I see that. <laughs> Guy. Let's get out. Get out of here. Get out of this. We don't need to talk about this. <laughs> Pull out. <laughs> I also want to point out this movie has very strong Stranger with Candy and or for a more recent reference, Pen 15 vibes in that mm. there are adults playing high schoolers 
alongside kids who literally look like high schoolers. Yeah. And I feel like it is purposefully jarring. It's really well done. <laughs> it makes me laugh because like Napoleon towers over these kids. John yeah. Hader, I imagine, is tall. Like the scene where they're at the egg farm, the chicken farm, and he's with these other boys, and those boys just literally look like 13-year-old boys, and then Napoleon's standing there looking like a 29-year-old man. It's just so awkward to see them together, but it did yeah. remind me of Pen15, where the two women in that movie are playing themselves, but in middle school, around a cast of middle school-appropriate kids. And then also, of course, Jerry Blank. But Jerry Blank in Strange But Candy also has like this goodwill style <laughs> that is also emulated in Napoleon Dynamite, where everyone just looks like they rolled out of the bargain bin at a right. thrift shop. Yeah. Everyone is dressed from a different decade in this movie. Rico yeah. is dressed in the late 70s. Napoleon's dressed in the early 80s. Kip is dressed in the late 80s. And then Deb is dressed like it's the early 90s. And it's canonically happening in 2004. If you see his, yeah. his little student ID at the beginning during the credits, it says 2004. You don't have any experience with this specific rural community, but have like <laughs> having some experience, like there is, you know, I don't like that sort of checks out for me. Like, <laughs> it's like a little bit out of time, you know? Right. We didn't really get into Napoleon's isms. You know, he has a lot of... Well, I figured there's going to be a slew of, of just us quoting the movie at some point. Yeah, that's but, coming, But we can everybody. go into his tics. Yeah, I just want to like know what you think of that. How do you take him as a character? We talked about like the sort of kind of icky, maybe a little bit parts of it. But what about just like... For humor's sake, how do you feel? Like, do you do you find him funny when he goes like God, or <laughs> the very first thing when he, or the, whatever? Whatever he, I feel like, gosh. When he calls Kip on the phone, and the very start, the first thing he does is, <sighs> which I really <laughs> liked that. I found that very funny. There's something very specific about Napoleon that I connected with when I first saw this movie, and connected with again rewatching it now. This might surprise you, but I was not popular in high school. <laughs> Pear-shaped, already balding, 17-year-old boys who can both quote Lord of the Rings and Thoroughly Modern Millie don't really <laughs> trend well in high schools across this great nation of ours. So I tended to hang out with a lot of nerds, some who I was nerdier than and some who were nerdier than me. I'm not trying to place myself on a pedestal. <laughs> but he was very familiar to me in a lot of ways. Like. Yeah. I mean, there's some of the stuff we've already sort of hinted at, the neurodivergent aspects that, you know, he doesn't like to maintain eye contact. He sort of runs away, literally, in some cases, from social situations when they're over. There's also like this barely contained anger at almost everyone yeah. that I recognized from a lot of guys, like when he's in the locker room and the guy's like, what did you do again this summer, Napoleon? He's like... Went up to Alaska with my uncle or whatever and shot wolverines. And he's like, and did you kill any? And he's like, yeah, at least like 50. He's always just very indignant and then sort of like defensive, understandably, yeah. which I also recognized. Also, this sort of bragging quality, this exaggerating quality, outright lying, one might say. Yeah. You know, of course, the infamous girlfriend who goes to a different school, he tries to pull that at one point. He needs room in his locker for his numchucks. <laughs> his numchucks. Talks about post staff skills. I mean, these were all very... <laughs> They reminded me of various people I have met in my life. Yeah. Some close friends. <laughs> but yeah, I recognize, I saw a lot of him in, or I saw a lot of people in him. How yeah. do you feel about him? Yeah, I, I think so too. I think I was trying to, like we said at the beginning, kind of think of it more, less than just a laugh character. Cause, but I think, you know, it's meant as a laugh. Like you're supposed <laughs> to just find him funny. And this was sort of always my barometer for this movie in the first place. If you find... Napoleon as a character funny, then this movie is going to be, you're going to either be like, oh, this is good, or you're going to love it. But if you don't, you just, you need to get out. It's just not, it's not for you. Yeah, there's not going to be anything for you here. Yeah. Because that's pretty much what the movie is. Yeah, you kind of have to live through that. But yeah, I, I still think, like I said, it does give me a little bit of pause because I do feel like I'm, you know, laughing at him more than yeah. with him. But I do still find it funny. It's a little bit. Maybe not the most mature laughs that I'm getting, but it's still <laughs> funny. 
No, I mean, I feel like there is also, I mean, aside from like stereotypical stuff, there is a specificity to him that I, I mean, the rage part of him, the part that is just so like defensive and like lying like that. Yeah. I mean, that is just funny. Like it is funny yeah. to me that he's, he's lying in a way that it's not intended to actually trick you. I feel like that's yeah. how I, when I had friends who also sort of pulled the, oh yeah, I have a girlfriend. She goes to a different school and she's actually British and. You know. It doesn't matter if you believe them or not. It's not really yeah, it's meant not, for it's deception. Yeah, it's not what it's about. It's yeah. just like, I want to stop talking about this. I don't want to be reminded about yeah. that, you know, none of my peers are interested in me in any romantic or sexual way. I definitely did. Just to come clean, I definitely did have a made-up girlfriend at some point. And I think yeah, I would have been junior high or yeah, Ooh. junior high and- Two towns over, three towns over. What no, are we talking she about lived. Here? She lived out of state, but I don't remember where she lived. It wasn't, ah. it wasn't Canada, but it was somewhere else. Her name was Harmony, I believe, and mm. it was only a lie. Listen, I'm not proud of this. It was only a lie because there was a girl who like liked me that I didn't like, and so I just was like, I have a girlfriend, and I was not perfect system popular with the girls at the time. I'm not sure why I didn't just <laughs> why you just why date they this were girl, just falling you know, loser. all over you. Did it you show them your best thing. skills or? I think that's what did it. I think that's why. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wanted to say there's also, I mean, John Hader brings other like characteristics like that are just like, I think just being an awkward teen or tween, yeah. like he'll scratch in a very weird way. Or like there's a one point where he scratches like the back of his arm on his leg. And it's like, yeah. I've never seen anyone do that in a movie before, but that is very much something that a teenager yeah. does. Like there is Absolutely. something very specific that he hones in on that makes Napoleon feel very real, even if he's sort of this ridiculous character. Kip as well. Kip, I also find very charming in a similar yeah, I wanna, way. Yeah, I want to get to Kip. I guess I wanted to touch on what you said, though, because this, and maybe it's just where you grow up or what your experiences were there, but I also feel like I've met, like Napoleon is an, an amalgam of characters that I've met over time. Again, some of whom became friends, some of whom that I'm sure I wasn't very nice to when I should have been, some that were like kind of bullies in my school, but were kind of like the awkward, but bigger than me bully, you know? <laughs> I mean, there's this, it's, very it's real, funny because I, I already brought up Strange But Candy, but I think that Strange But Candy is one of my favorite shows because even though it's absolutely ridiculous, it does paint a view of high school that I find very relatable. And this, in that same way, despite its ridiculousness and how over the top it can seem, there is something very relatable to it. Yeah. Like Summer and her boyfriend, I think his name is Don, who looks like a 40-year-old man, like straight. Yeah. Like even beyond John Hader and everyone else in the cast, like I'm like, that is someone's dad who is impersonating a, a teenager. They're not like overtly mean, but there's like a cruelty to them that I reckon, like when he's asking yeah. Napoleon, like, what did you do this summer? That scene I referenced earlier, like he doesn't say anything, mock Napoleon yeah. in any way. It's just obvious that he's asking these questions in a like, in a mocking in way. joke yeah. with his friends to make totally. it, you know, to make fun of Napoleon in some, what's the word I'm looking for? Between him and his friends, like it's internalized. Yeah. And- I don't know. It, it, that is very realistic to me. And there's not like an overt cruelty. They don't make them into like arch villains. And I feel yeah. like that's also true of high school. Like Summer is never right overtly mean, I don't think. Yeah, she's kind of Played snotty. by Haley Duff. She's just kind of a snotty popular yeah. girl. Yeah. Who then when you run into her at Kroger five years after high school pretends you were best friends. And you're yeah. like, what the fuck, Summer? Yeah. I don't know. It's very accurate, even though it's so unrealistic. Yeah. It's exaggerated for sure. What do you think about, let me hear your thoughts on Kip. Give it to I me. love Kip. <laughs> I just want to cradle him. He, I guess he's 32. <laughs> he is a stay-at-home son, or Napoleon's stay-at-home brother, who just goes on chat rooms all day, costs his grandmother an arm and a leg for the dial-up modem. Mm -hmm. He's apparently got some sort of online relationship with a woman named LaFonda who lives in Detroit. And he also is interested in becoming a cage fighter. Mm. There's a weirdness, again, going back to my point about like how even though it's like over the top, it, there is like a through line of relatability there. Like Kip and Napoleon snipe it at each other, snipe at each other throughout the movie. But sometimes like when Kip sort of gets 
hurt or like slapped, like when you get slapped by Diedrich Bader in that weird Rex Kwon Do session they go to. Like there's a flash of like concern on Napoleon's face. Yeah. That I caught that he's like sad that his brother is sort of being humiliated in front of everyone. And even when you see at the end when Kip gets on the bus going to Detroit with La Fonda, like there is a smile that comes on Napoleon's face knowing that Kip's like gotten out of here and found a girl. It's very, there is like a brotherly love, even though they seem to snipe but all the time. They kind of, yeah, bickering. snap like uh, when Napoleon has him in a headlock and then <laughs> what does he say? <laughs> I, I want to get you, it right. I think Hold you on. tore off my mole. Yeah, I think you tore off my mole. And he's like, is it bleeding? And he's like, a little. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't know, that feels very, I mean, I don't have a brother and I certainly don't have a sibling that's 16 years older than me, but like that feels very <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yes. Cause it's like, you know, it's like, it's not serious. I didn't mean to actually hurt you. Yeah. They're just like, they're just kind of, I don't know. That's very accurate. I think Kip has so many lines in this too, but he, Kip is the secret quote machine. In this he book. is. I also like that not to skip forward a little bit. His like, so the big reveal of course, is that not only is LaFonda real, which I don't know, but if I was supposed to doubt, but I definitely did in the first time I saw this because, you know, I don't think it deliberately does it, but I feel like Napoleon sort of lying about his girlfriend sort of yes. leads you to believe that Kip is also lying. Well, and it's a very not. common trope, you know, like the guy who lives at home in his basement gets catfished, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this very tall black woman gets off the bus and she is so sweet. She is genuinely into him. She loves him. I mean, and they get married in the <laughs> post credit scene, which I like. They... I just, she, you know, it would have been nice if she had, we don't really get much of her personality. She basically has one or two, you know, speaking. I mean, she's not thoroughly fleshed out, but she does give Napoleon yeah. the dance track that I guess he eventually the, dances the to The turning Pedro's. point of, of yeah. the movie, I guess. She's the wise sage. She's the Obi-Wan yeah. Kenobi, the Gandalf the Grey. Or even you could argue that, you know, she's like Tiresias in Hell. And when, uh -huh. I was going when to, Odysseus if you goes me, down if you to, get, do get there. to get a talisman, right. that talisman in this case is the tape of it's, Jamiroquai. That's canned heat. Yeah. <laughs> but I was just saying, I just really enjoyed that she was not only real, but also very sweet and into Kip. And they were very like, they seemed very much into each other. It's a very weird looking couple as far as <laughs> their pairing but you know i'm glad they're happy yeah i mean i think it is a charming moment when she when i think the first time i saw it when she got off the bus i was expecting one of them to be surprised by how the other looks but they seem they're to both into it be smitten with each other how do you feel about kip's transformation yeah so he gets kind of a for a coded but less slightly less racist way to say it, he gets an urban makeover. She gets him a giant chain and he's wearing like a, a do rag at the end and it's wearing sort of oversized like like that's, a big That's not great. <laughs> but it's also like I guess the implication, because she got him the chain, is that she wants him to look this way. She's like mm -hmm. But I don't I don't think there's anything more in depth there. Right. I think the joke is like, let's get this scrawny white kid exactly. in these clothes. Exactly. And I guess you could almost, I guess it's not really for me to say, but it's like, it's a little bit, you can let them off the hook a little bit for it because he is not trying to do something specifically. She's like, wear these clothes. And he's like, okay. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's not great, but also. Yeah, it's not the worst thing I've ever it's seen. It's thing. just this weird kind of like jarring moment, but it's not terrible. No. You want to talk about Deb? Deb. Yeah. So this is Tina Majorino. I actually looked up an interview, so I made sure I was saying this okay. correctly. You would know her. She was in Waterworld, of Water course, World. one of your all-time favorites. She was one of the Karinas from Karina Karina. She was the primary Karina. Okay. And I feel like she's been in a number of other things, but she was a child star and then she had taken a break and then she came back with Napoleon Dynamite. Now she's on the CBS crime procedural Scorpion. Hmm. Which may or may not be on the air anymore. I didn't care to well, look. It's definitely a show that I knew existed before this very moment. So <laughs> I believe it's about hacking. One of okay. your favorite topics. Hacking. Sure. As I said earlier, she is sort of styled like late 80s, early 90s. Got a side She's pone. got a side, hard side pony. Like that would make mm -hmm. Jojo Siwa like uncomfortable. 
She runs sort of a glamour shot style thing out of her basement. Yeah. She also sells like handmade crafts, which are mostly like key fobs made out of that plastic twine that you can braid that I only saw on the streets of Beach High School. I never saw them <laughs> being sold in an actual store. Just girls handing them to each other. Yeah. I don't know what the market was, what the black market on plastic handmade. What's the resale on these? things. Yeah. But she's good. I mean, she's sort of... She doesn't fall into like the manic pixie dream girl trope. And she's also just not a trophy girl either. She does like, she is in the plot. And she but has we her don't own get much life. out of her. Yeah. And she's also very shy. So that's some of that is yes. by character design. But also, yeah, she she has her own life that we see glimpses of. So it's not she's like. She's saving the, up for college. Yeah. And, you know, she has her own studio. She gets to be like our style person. I heard like little mm, she does looking at her options and thinking that's. Very cute. And she seems very What does she sweet. say when she's taking Uncle Rico's picture? I think that's the one. Yeah. This is going to yeah. look really nice. <laughs> really like, yeah. I think that's going to come out really nice. That's what she's <laughs> <laughs> I've had that quoted to me by someone before and I didn't know what it was from. And now I'm grateful. <laughs> yeah. And she, so she is obviously the semi-romantic interest, although it's never anything more than a friendship in the movie, but it's like kind of the pairing for Napoleon. And then she goes to the, I like that she goes to the dance with Pedro because he asked her. And so that's a good tip on getting yeah. girls to go with you to dances. Just, just, to, you know, just at least pose the question at the very least. Tried see, you know what happens, but also Pedro comes with, you know, why don't you give her something? Why don't you show, you know, show, show a talent, her you like draw her a picture. But there's also like, it's very quickly resolved. We can get into to Pedro and Napoleon's <laughs> friendship as well, but it's not like, She's like, yeah, we're just friends. It's like not right. a problem. But yeah, she gets that. And then she gets the conflict, of course, is Uncle Rico grossly Ugh. tries to sell her like breast enlargement. Bust herbs. plus must, I believe. It's an it's herbal, like an herbal supplement enhance, to yeah, enhance yeah. Your, your bosoms. That was gross. It was just gross enough that I was a little annoyed that Uncle Rico gets sort of a, happy I mean, ending. not really a redemption, but he gets a happy ending. Yeah. Not from her. Not from her. No, your honor. <laughs> But his girlfriend, Nancy, who tells him accurately that he's living in the past, comes, comes back, back to him. And I'm like, lady, she looked great. Like, I was like, what are you doing? Get out of here. Get out of here as soon as possible. Yeah, Uncle Rico's a creep. Uncle Rico, I guess, is the closest thing this movie is has to a villain in that he sort of consistently and purposefully, I would argue, humiliates Napoleon. Kip and Napoleon. Yeah. Kip really craves his, his validation from Uncle Rico. In that, you know, he sort of goes along with Uncle Rico's fucking, you know, salesman scheme yeah. and sort of compliments Uncle Rico's terrible football videos, at least defending them from the charge of the, the worst movie I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. He does say to Napoleon, Napoleon, there's no way you could possibly know that. <laughs> I do want to say Uncle Rico does have one of my favorite moments in the movie, which is when it's just him and Kip sitting at the diner and they're talking about something and, and we go like sits with his arms crossed and then tries to like he like makes a point to flex out his biceps he's only half listening to kip while kip talks about <laughs> la fonda which is also one of my favorite quotes and this is one that bethany would i think she would name it her favorite quote but things are getting pretty serious we talk online every day for two hours so i guess you could say it's getting pretty serious <laughs> like this i love that he says it again he has nothing new to say <sighs> Peace out. That's another one. He goes, Peace out. Pedro. You want to talk about Pedro? I guess we're just going through characters. I didn't just... We just, just I mean, that's just the, nice, I think that's the, nice really the best way to go yeah. about this. So Pedro is a new student, Pedro Sanchez. I'm very concerned for Pedro. I don't know about you. I'm concerned about his health. Yeah. What is wrong with Pedro? Do we know? <laughs> physically? He misses school at least twice in the course of this movie. No one else seems to miss school. The first time he's just sick. And it's yeah. not explained. Later, though, and I mean, it's sort of after he's decided to run against Summer for school president or class president, and he realizes how popular Summer is and how, like, organized Summer is, I think he has, I would argue, a panic attack, maybe, where he just starts sweating okay. and can't stop sweating. And so he goes home and shaves off his hair because he believes his hair is making him hot. So he shaves it but off. But isn't he sick before that? Before? No, no, no. Yeah, he misses school one day. Yeah. And it's never explained. I mean, people miss school. Yeah. It's a slice of life, I, mean, I but guess, it's, as you, to use your own words. It's Chekhov's absence. 
It is this weird, like people who are absent in movies, just like just like the cough in Act yeah, One. Yeah, it's, like, oh. it's like, why are you why are you not in this scene? What's going on? Where's Pedro? Yeah, I actually thought when I was in the movie theater watching this first time, I'm remembering this on this rewatch. I thought like it was going to be a fault in our star situation. I was like, oh no, oh no, Pedro's going to pass away. These He's going to teach us an important lesson about life. But no, we did not get. Bridge to Terry Bethiad this time. <laughs> so Pedro is an interesting character because he's pretty self-assured, even though he is as yeah. popular as, as Napoleon. And he doesn't get picked on as far as we know, but he seems to genuinely Except like from, Napoleon. From the, the principal or whatever who keeps saying racist stuff to him. I don't know right. how you do I it. I don't know how they do things yeah. in Juarez. Yeah. I don't know if Pedro is from Juarez or if the principal was just saying Juarez because it was the first Mexican town he could think of. Pedro seems pretty self-assured, though. Like, he's pretty confident. He asks, even though he's a new student there, he asks Summer out, uh, bakes her a cake and leaves makes it on her, her stoop. Cake. Um, he's got a pretty sweet bike that he can do some sweet jumps off of. Doesn't seem too upset about getting a no from Summer, either. He's like, well, Yeah, he just else. moves on and asks uh, Deb. He's pretty skilled in FFA. He's good at spotting a fifth nipple on a cow. Like that. He has two cousins in the movie. Yeah. At least two cousins. And they're sort of, how would you describe the cousins, DJ? See how I just shoved this onto you? Well, they're coded gangbangers. Like, they they come in right. like a, a, you know, a car with hydraulics that says vote for Pedro, Pedro and they're they're like, They've got like A shirts on A shirts, yeah. and they've got sort of buzz cuts and mustaches and they just look tough. Yeah. I don't think they have any lines in the movie, but they seem like genuine sweethearts. <laughs> they really do. And all they do to the kid that is bullying someone who agreed to, or they say, hey, if Napoleon says to this kid who's getting picked on, Pedro will take care of this for you, basically. And then later- What was that, it? He uses a mafia term. Yeah, I can't remember what it says. You have Pedro's protection. Yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> and then later the kid is getting bullied at the bike rack and and they, they just roll up and they just shake their heads. They don't do anything to this kid. Yeah, they pull up in their, their car. The hydraulics go, I think, once or twice. Yeah. And then they just shake their heads silently at the bully and the bully runs away. Yeah. And when Napoleon is running late for his dance, they pick him up and then take him to his- his date's house, Trisha's house, doing hydraulic tricks in the driveway, which I was charmed by, honestly. And then they drive him and Trisha to the dance. Nothing untoward happens, <laughs> really. It's charming, but there is something, I mean, it's sort of in the same vein as Kip's like makeover at the end of the movie where it's like, why, why do you sort of portray them in this sort of, everyone else is like this very awkward, like goodwill chic. And then you just have these guys in a souped up car with hydraulics. You know, it just seems like a weird. You're supposed moment. to fill in the blanks with stereotypes, which right. I think we both That's what did. I feel like I'm being yeah. forced to do you the stereotyping do here. Yeah. Most importantly, though, we have one of my favorite lines by Pedro, which is we have a great FFA schedule lined up. And I'd like to see more of that. That's in his presidential. <laughs> Candidacy speech. <laughs> his his presidential uh, campaign is more of the same from Pedro. Yeah. So that's the climax of the movie. So should we talk about Pedro's candidacy for president? Yeah. And probably the most lasting piece of ephemera from this movie yes. is Napoleon's vote for Pedro t-shirt in the standard Garfield or and or Judy Bloom font on the shirt. Yeah. You nodded in a very specific way, <laughs> like you had farted, but you didn't want to let me on. You said Garfield, and I, my mind was off the races. I was like, <laughs> what are we talking about? What just happened? <laughs> you know that font, that weird, like, sort of 70s, 80s, like, bubble font with the real I came back rounded around, serifs? But you you set me off and I with by saying Garfield, and I couldn't make it back in time to stop nodding weirdly. That's all I'm explaining. <laughs> You're not wrong. You didn't say anything wrong. Who would you have voted for? Let's talk about that first. Oh, um, I would vote for Pedro every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Like, fuck summer. Yeah, I think he's clearly got, you know, well, before or after the dance. Would I have voted for Pedro before or after the dance? Before the, like, the town. Oh, I'm showcase. sorry. Okay. I thought you meant the dance, like the, the school dance. But I would have voted for Pedro just out of animosity towards, towards summer. summer. Yeah. But after the dance, I probably would have voted for... For Pedro, for Pedro. Did your class presidents have to make a speeches 
or B, do a talent portion? I have a vague memory of speeches. The skit, and I want to talk about the definition of skit. It's, yeah, I guess they use that in the Skits, open, do no. what you want. Yeah. Although I can certainly see a school pulling this where it's like, and then you can do something funny, like to encourage them to like, yeah, do like, you know, some sugar with your vegetables. A friend of the show, Tommy Boy is my favorite movie, was our class president. My arch nemesis. <laughs> yeah. And I don't remember them giving us speech, but now that I'm thinking about it, they might have had to over the announcement or was that, that from a TV show? To me. Was that from a TV show? I don't know. The good point. <laughs> it all blurs. It all blurs. But they definitely didn't have to do a talent portion. And I loved the Summer and her friends dance. They had to do like a, they did like a dance team. It looked like they were also on the dance team and they danced to Larger Than Life by the Backstreet yes, Boys. Backstreet and Boys. it's kind of bad, but it's not like like if you saw, you know, a high school dance team doing this, you'd be like, okay, good job, guys. Yeah, you've recognized, you've choreographed something here. And I think that's, I don't know, it was a very skillful <laughs> display by the actors involved because it was like not good enough to be good, but not bad enough to be laughable. No, and it I was, like very, that's a hard thing it was to very in that, that wheelhouse because they weren't entirely on the beat, but they weren't so off the beat that you could really... Say, hey, she's yeah. bad. As our erstwhile president would say, it was very low energy. It was a lot of more hands than you'd expect. Yes. It was a lot of those people were in the happy hands club that we saw earlier in the movie. Yes. Doing hand motions to the rose by Bette Midler. <laughs> a lot of this. A lot of that. That's not a skit. Neither is dancing alone a skit, really. No. Also sketch, please. Let's not. No one wants to hear. Did you finish your little skit? Are you quoting, what is it, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip right now? <laughs> oh, no. Am I? Possibly. Yeah, I think you are because <laughs> one of the characters gets like, goes off on his mom because they're like, they're sketches, not skits. I'm not in a high school play or something like that. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, my brother did watch Studio 60. I love that show. I did, was it great? No. But did I love it? Yes. Was it self-important? Yes. yes. Yeah. Let's talk about Napoleon's dance. Okay. So... Probably the longest, yeah, one of the longest lasting legacies of this movie is this Napoleon does a full song of Canned Heat by Jamiroquai, like improvised dance of the new dance moves that he's been learning on the videotape he found in the thrift store. And it, I think it's great. It's This holds up for me. I think the key to a good dance is commitment. And he is committed. He is not he half-assing is committed. this. Because you don't have to be the most amazing dancer to be entertaining, right? It's funny because when everybody cheers at the end, they're, I don't think they're making fun of him. Like, they're, they enjoyed it. They might have been amused. I don't think he is also, I don't know, obviously, like, the, as a movie, like, the movie is like, this is silly, right? We're sort of, like, entertained by it. But it's also, like, there's some good moves in there. There's something very charming about this moment. And I was trying to place what it is that wins me over. I think, like, after... He's doing it for Pedro, for one thing. He's doing it for Pedro, and there's, like, an earnestness about it, like an honesty, <laughs> to sound completely pretentious, there's an honesty about it that we haven't really gotten, like... More honesty in dance, you know? For whatever reason, like, always keeps you at arm's length. I think purposefully, like, he... Yeah lies just sort of casually he always is like he has a bristly like personality prickly you know sort of defensive nature yeah. to him understandably as i've said already and then this moment like where he sort of puts himself on the line and like genuinely dances it is in character in that napoleon yeah. has a confidence about him that i find very charming but also like where is this coming from <laughs> but it is very sweet and even though i think this movie like carts in a lot of like oh my god this is so random moments right this is a random moment that i do think overall works and like gels at least this last act into something and it did make me my heart swell a little bit and the end when there's like this sort of musical epilogue and you just see where everyone sort of landed after all this we do see that pedro is elected president it's very charming it works it is and also that song slaps so it is a good song by jamiroquai and you don't hear that very often, do you, anymore? Music for a Found Harmonium is the name of the song that plays at the end. The the sort of instrumental. Yeah. -na 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 -na. I looked it up because I was like, what is this? It did sound familiar to me. And I, I feel like from something else other than this. Yeah. And I forgot to look up 
Was it in a pork commercial? I don't know, but it is. It's a great song. That's all. Let's see. <laughs> Here's a complete list: movies and TV shows. It's in. Okay, you're, it's not going to be Wizard of Oz. It's in. It's all gone. Pete Tong, also 2004. It's in The Founder, starring Michael Keaton in 2016. Okay. So that's not it. And that's all according to this website, which may or may not be accurate. And what anyway, was the first one you listed? Did you just say Napoleon it's, Dynamite? It's all gone, Pete Tong. I don't know. Look. All right. Don't talk to me. Talk to what-song.com, okay? And that's a name I can trust. Please edit all this out. <laughs> now, do you want to do quotes you actually like or quotes that people quoted? I absolutely do not want to do quotes people quoted. <laughs> I only want to do quotes I liked. Okay, I'll start then. I'm pretty busy right now. (laughs) Um, It's pretty much my favorite animal. It's like a lion and tiger mixed, bred for its skills and magic. Uh, That just that phrasing, like alone, is lion and tiger mixed rather than a mix of lion and tiger, and then bred for its skills and magic, casually thrown out. Ludicrous. This is not a quote, but so. You and I, I don't know if we've ever referenced this on the podcast before, but we were once shopping for furniture at uh, Ashley Home Goods, and we encountered the most awkward sales pitch of all time. This woman came up to us, and I, well, I think it wasn't the actual store, it was like the outlet or something, but she came up and gave this clearly rehearsed spiel that she gave no emphasis on any syllables to like, no, <laughs> she just read it off the back of her eyelids. And that was very similar. And it was a... Hold on to your shoes because this deal is going to knock your socks off. We have uh, 40% off all floor models and you can get them today and today only. So make sure to talk to me. I'm Lindsay and you can talk to me today. Thank you very much. And we heard her like she like said it and then like turned away. And then like <laughs> we could hear her say it to someone else and we were like, what is happening? But anyway, that is also. Well, we also had to stand there looking at her as if we were two people engaged in conversation with her. Yeah. And. That was very much the same as Deb's initial pitch. She comes up clearly expecting a woman, a woman to answer the door, a female presenting person to answer the door. And, it's, and she just goes into her spiel anyway. Do you want to look like this? She holds up a glamour shot. And Napoleon says, this is a girl. And then yeah. the, and Deb just goes on to whatever the next going. sentence is. That's my next one. It's not a good, it's not really a quote, but. You already said this, but I want that. When that when Rico pulls that clipper ship and that woman just sort of turns. That might be my favorite. It's an insane scene. That couple together is my nomination for a Sally Field single scene award. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Because Rico then puts to the husband like to try and tear this essentially Tupperware. Tupperware. And the guy tries to and is ashamed that he He couldn't. I can't. I can't do it. <laughs> and he hangs his head in shame. And his wife is a little disappointed She's in him that he couldn't tear it. And then we cut to Kip trying <laughs> to do a variation on the same demonstration, where he just puts the Tupperware behind the back wheels of Rico's car <laughs> and van. runs over it. It explodes. And he goes, <laughs> shatters ever, and he just drives away. It's like the presentation is over. Goodbye. <laughs> That was probably my one of my favorite parts. Oh, man. This is definitely something that people quoted at me as well. So mm-hmm. it's also annoying, but also still amusing me, which is, your mom goes to college. <laughs> <laughs> your mom goes to college. And then he's so pleased with himself. He's so pleased. So there's a brief scene where Napoleon is working at a chicken farm. Well, so gross. <laughs> Napoleon had some beginning questions, and he just goes, do the chickens have large talons? And the farmer goes, what? And he goes, the chickens, do they have large talons? And the farmer responds, I don't understand a word you just said. And then that's the end. That's it. Then we cut to Napoleon doing a, a bit. This is LaFonda says, kitchen. why are you so sweaty? That's how she <laughs> introduces herself to Napoleon. <laughs> do like that. And he does his sweet dance moves and he drinks his Gatorade and he like, he jerks, his, jerks head his head back so fast and the Gatorade goes all down his shirt. And then he puts, DJ, he puts that Gatorade back into the fridge after his sweaty lips. And the way he was drinking, you know, there's backwash Ugh. in there. <laughs> so this is a quote from the, the epilogue post credit scene. 
<laughs> when I actually so, realized I have forgotten to watch the post. I've seen it before, but I forgot to watch it this time around. Well, there's, you know, Kip's song. So that Kip and the Fonda get married. This is two months later. The title card tells us. And everybody's there. Our main characters are there. Deb's not. And she's taking pictures. And the only person who's not there is Napoleon. And Napoleon at the end. So Kip sings a little song for <laughs> – it's a very awkward song to La Fonda. And I love technology, but not as much as you use <laughs> And yeah. the song is great. I missed – the post credit scene in when I saw it in the theater, because people would quote that song and I would be like, I saw this movie. What are you talking <laughs> yeah. about? And I didn't take any bathroom breaks. Yeah. What are you quoting? You weren't trained yet. I had a you weren't trained bu- yet to stay during the, the credits. <laughs> I had a stadium buddy. I stayed the whole movie. <laughs> but Napoleon comes awkwardly riding up on a horse and it's his gift. He tamed the wild he says, I tamed a wild st- honeymoon stallion for you to ride off on. <laughs> Which is funny. And then he high fives Pedro, which I liked. Like Pedro's like, yeah, fuck yeah. Good. You got a nice job getting that horse. I just, I don't know. I like their friendship. And then when they get on the horse, when LaFonda and Kip get on the horse, he says, uh, Napoleon says, I hope, I hope your guys' experiences are unforgettable. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just like really ridiculous. It does remind me though, like, I referenced this before, but probably the most dated aspect of this is like, it's sort of, there's a slice of life aspect that I really like about this movie, but then there's like moments where it dips into like sort of that 2000s vibe of like dipping into either, oh my God, isn't this so random into, or, oh, this is so awkward. The awkward thing I think fits more with the movie because all the characters are sort of awkward with each other and it's sort of staged in that stilted way. And I'd like to talk about that in a minute as my closing thing remembered my big thing. Oh boy. It's not that big of a thing. (laughs) You probably heard stories. It's not that big of a final thing. So just don't be like when I show the final thing, I don't want you to like be like, oh, it's not that big of a thing. (laughs) It's a normal size. It's an average for my height. It's an average size thing. (laughs) Foy says you're a grower, not a shower of the thing, of the <laughs> Of the last final point. thing that I yeah. talk about on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's this random aspect that, that pops up every once in a while. I think like it comes up with the chicken juice, the chi- the egg juice drink, which is like this weird moment of like gross out humor. And then I'm like, it's just very jarring. Like I like that they, the, the chicken farm gives them egg sandwiches and hard boiled eggs. Hard boiled eggs. Yeah. Like, I'm like, of course. And it's gross that I would have an egg sandwich with a side of egg. When it's like 90 degrees outside, too. Right. And, and the flies are everywhere. There are a lot of flies in this movie, I also want to point out. Yeah. I don't know what like that the, was. The, they were like, we can't edit around them. So we're just going to point them out when they come up. And at one point, Napoleon says, like, I caught you a large bass, like, to. Yeah. That was more Nicolas Cage than Napoleon delicious Dynamite, bass. but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, delicious bass. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. And it's also like not there. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I'm like, oh, why are you talking about this? I mean, it hardly breaks the movie, but it is right. th- these these jarring moments where I feel like overall, they really know exactly what their world is and what they want to do, even if it doesn't jibe with everyone. Like, I feel like they have a specific, like look and feel for this movie and then so when those moments like come out they really stick out they really stick out because otherwise the movie is very specifically curated before we get to your final point it's a normal thing it's a normal it's gonna be like just so good that we can't do anything after i don't want to oversell the point have you heard of the napoleon dynamite problem i just read about this I in saw this when I was also doing yeah. doing the elaborate research that you were also doing on um, various like, Wikipedia Like literally just sites. Googling the movie and seeing what comes up. <laughs> yes, where – yeah, can you describe it better than I can? I mean, Apparently I it's can. a problem in predictive algorithms. So like you know, Netflix or, or the other streaming service, like they have algorithms of like this is the kind of movie that this kind of person will like. And it's based on your taste in movies. And apparently there are movies like Napoleon Dynamite is the prime example. And then also Lost in Translation and I Heart Huckabees, at mm-hmm. least at okay. the time. So David O. Russell movies and this movie. <laughs> Did he do it Lost in Translation too? Oh, you know what? He didn't. That's Sofia say, Coppola. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think he did that. But those movies break the algorithm because they are not predictive of other movies that people will like. Although I like all three of those movies, so. <laughs> Create a new algorithm, guys. The TJ algorithm. Yeah, just use me as a lookalike audience. <laughs> 
But no, I had never heard of that before. I find that kind of stuff mildly interesting, but I don't have any insight from it. I just think this, it is interesting to note. Uh, and I think it's worth about, you know, 15 seconds of discussion of, it's interesting to note that this is weird, a weird enough movie that it can cause that kind of problem. And that, that kind of checks out to me because it is kind of quirky. I can see, I can see the same kind of people either loving or hating it because it's so like specific. I think, and this sort of goes into my final point, and I realized that you actually made this point during our introduction that we filmed or recorded weeks ago, but that there's a lot of Wes Anderson in this movie, yeah. even though, mm-hmm. like, looks-wise, it wouldn't match Wes Anderson's, like, mid-century style. This is more of, like, an 80s, 70s, 80s curated look. But there is, I think Wes Anderson sort of fits into that mold as well of, like, yeah. you either like it or you hate it, and there are a lot of people of different demographics who do not like Wes Anderson because it's so can be so cold and removed and specific that it removes them from the experience. And then other people really like Wes Anderson for those very reasons. Yeah. I think this movie never rises to the level of Wes Anderson. I do like Wes Anderson. I don't think this ever rises. (laughs) That's not the phrase, but you know what I mean? It takes all kinds and it contains multitudes. So close. So close. Keep workshopping it. The point is, is that there is a lot of Wes Anderson in this. There's a lot. I, I keep thinking of that scene in the FFA test where he's drinking those three mason jars full of milk, yeah. tainted milk, and he had to identify what the issue was with each one. But that's like, it's like a very Wes Anderson framing and even editing. Like it, it's a shot of him, three glasses of milk centered in, right in front of him, the camera straight on. He's flanked by almost identical white old men FFA judges. And then he drinks each glass of milk and we get a close up of him drinking it, like zoomed in on his f- mouth so that we can see like, you know, how the milk thickens your spit. We see that in the corners of his mouth. And then he tells us what, he, what each problem with each jar is. That The def- defect in that one is it contains bleach. This one tastes like the cow got into an onion patch. <gasps> um, <laughs> it's not as like persnickety as Wes Anderson's can get, but there are a lot of touches in that. And even in the set design, like it's very specific. Like every, you feel like everything is there for a reason and was chosen to be in that shot, in a lot yeah. of the shots of this movie. All right. What, do you want me to do like a drum roll for your last point? That was my last point. That, that was, was it. it? Oh, I okay. told you it's a normal. See, I it's was nothing to write home about, another... but it's a fine point, is what I'm saying. You just built it up too much. The point gets the job done. Like, let's not focus on how big or surprising the point is. You gave the point like a little trailer, like a teaser trailer. So by the time we got there, I thought, okay, do you want to go to the verdict? Yeah, let's go. Damon Zanthopoulos. Hi. What is your verdict on Napoleon Dynamite? Your inner child is not an idiot. Whoa. I, I giggled a lot in this movie. I did not break down laughing like I did the first time I saw it. I don't know if it if I've just gotten older or if it just doesn't hit the same, but it is a very enjoyable movie. And it's eminently quotable. It doesn't really have much of a plot. It is whatever. I don't know, like a like a pastiche. I, I don't even think that's accurate. It's more of a slice of life, if you must. But it's very enjoyable. I think like there's a lot of love in this, and there's a specificity to it that if it clicks with you, it will really click with you. And if it doesn't click with you, you're going to yeah. have a miserable 90 minutes. You're not going to have um, time. But I really don't have much more to say. That I, it's, it's a great movie. Check it out at your local video store. Before I get to my verdict... I'd like to nominate the the couple for the uh, Sally Field Single Scene Award, and I would also like to Absolutely. nominate Kip for the Catherine O'Hara Memorial MVP Award because I feel like the humor would not be. I will second both of those. Yes. All right. Absolutely. And my verdict is is as follows: Your inner child is not an idiot. I <laughs> I agree with you that this maybe lost some. If we were like ranking, like giving it points, it would have lost some points over the years. I don't like want to run and rewatch it. I don't, I'd be probably okay if I never see it again, but I also wow. wouldn't hate it. Like, you know, if it came up, 
And I think Kip running over the tip of Tupperware was the <laughs> most I laughed out loud. But Kip really, I think I found Kip more annoying the for, on first watch than this time. I found him really funny. So maybe it's just like cycles over the, and I found Napoleon Diamond didn't get like on my nerves. The character didn't get on my nerves, but because I felt like I was making fun of, a, you know, the weird kid a little bit yeah. more this time because I, I don't know, maybe it's just I've grown up, hopefully. <laughs> I've just become a little bit more sensitive to that. And I do, though, as the movie goes on, I do think it's like, you know, mostly celebrating him in a, you know, I don't know. It's not, again, I don't want to let the movie completely off the hook for that. They also use the R word once. I don't want to let them off the hook for, they hook did, for that. They did. You're absolutely right. They did. And a little bit of like coded, slight racist stuff with uh, the Kip's glow up and with Pedro's cousins are they cousins yeah there is cousins i even as we talk about it i get less comfortable co- i don't want to say it's racist there's something jarring about it though it doesn't I mean, seem they're to not belong villains or like yeah. played up as like buffoons or anything there's just something it just doesn't jibe with the rest of the movie so it seems like a weird touch it's similar to the to pedro's cousins his like his new outfits it's like it's letting me do the racist work. Like, what do you what do you want me to think of this? Do you like, want me to laugh are, just because they, you know, they have a souped up car or he's wearing a do rag? Is that what you want me to laugh? But at? it's like they're just like, doesn't he look silly? And the answer is yes. You know, so yeah. But Kip also looks silly in just you know khaki shorts and his beige socks. The worst color for socks, everyone. Right. <laughs> the worst color for socks. Anyway, your inner child is not an idiot. I, I liked it. I think if you liked it the first time, you're still gonna like it. And if you didn't I like think it. it I don't think it's going to reverse on you. I think if you like hated this, Absolutely. you're not going to all of a sudden like it. It's not a thing where it's like, oh, your tastes have changed and matured. You're still going to find it annoying. Like Lauren still found it annoying. So, Oh, really? Yeah. We should have her on. She refuses. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good, I it's think on offer. it's a, it's a good offer. Saturday afternoon movie that you might stumble upon on TV, but you're not going to buy the Blu-ray. You just want to like, oh, I stumbled upon dynam- uh, no, Dynamite, I call it. Just Dynamite. Dynamite. The sequel, Black Dynamite, you might be familiar with. Uh-huh. This is the first one, Napoleon Dynamite. We need to make a list of your Saturday afternoon movies because you've said that before. <laughs> I don't know. It's a very specific qualifier where I'm like, if you stumble upon it, you will watch it to the end. Yeah. But you're never going to be like, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. The American President for me is like... Saturday afternoon, American President's on. Yeah. I'm going to have to watch it until he goes to the State of the Union. <laughs> My name is blah, blah, and I am the president. Andrew Shepard. My name is Andrew yeah. Shepard, and I am the president. I wonder if that, we should watch that for President's Day. Yeah. Oh, wait. It's already February. We already fucked up. Shit. <laughs> next year. Let's get him next year. All right. You want to do Peachies? Oh, yeah. Peach. Oh, wait. What do you think, everybody? Oh, Email right. us, your inner child's an idiot at gmail.com. You can leave us a voicemail or text us 615-576-0525. We'd love to hear from you. You can support the show at patreon.com slash your inner child's an idiot. We got tears. You can get your name in the credits. You can get your, us to announce your names like we're about to because we want to thank our current patrons, including Captain Jean-Luc Picard, Travis Vance, Tommy Boy's is my favorite movie. I'm sorry, what? I just didn't quite hear that. What was that? <laughs> Tommy Boy is my favorite movie. Well, maybe it's me saying the Who's Tommy Boy is my favorite movie. That's probably what it is. The Zesty. Probably. The Supreme Ruler of this podcast. The Hands of Fate. The Elusive Fan Gromkin. T Smith. Shit on the Cartouche. Skelthosaurus. Ryan McWilly. Particle Man. Lindsay Nell. Lindsay Halleck. Larissa Maestro. Karen Curd. Just Cuz. Josh Frigo. Jonathan Day. Jeremy Palin. James Taylor. Jackson has an unhealthy obsession with Damon. His Honor the Mayor. Heather Tuggle. Dramatically placed hot dog. Dr. Malcolm's heaving bosom. David Mort. Dan McIntyre. Damon's Austrian accent. Caroline Amerson. And Beth Sermont. Thank you all so very much. If you want to support like them, patreon.com slash your inner child is an idiot. You want to dance for us to a lesser known Jamiroquai song? It looks obscene below the camera, but I'm just doing that little hand thing that he ends the... Yeah, you're doing like that old prospector dance. Is that what that (laughs) is? Where you just sort of lift your knees up and then you just sort of fist bump towards the ground. Is that what you're doing? Yes. Okay. 
And then I'll jump back on my hands and do this. Oh, yeah, I like that. It's a good dance. In the limited camera space, though, it did look like you were giving a Nazi salute. But I oh, imagine no. there was a... <laughs> I imagine there was leg motions that I couldn't see outside of the, the liminal though. space. No. No.